And next Friday at the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury, organised by the Friars Music Club, you can see Altered Images live. And they are supporting orchestral manoeuvres in the dark. And after one o'clock, I'm going to be talking to the co-founder of OMD, Andy McCluskey. OMD have sold 40 million records worldwide. They've released 13 studio albums and had 17 top 40 hits in the UK. Incredible! OMD were one of the central figures in the emergence of synth pop in the late 70s and early 80s, alongside bands such as the Human League, Ultravox, and Depeche Mode, and Cabaret Voltaire. So, we're going to talk to Andy McCluskey after one o'clock today. It's a real good show, I think. He's going to explain how OMD were formed, why they were so named, how they got a lucrative recording contract, and their most famous album, Architecture and Morality, which is 40 years old this year. So you can see OMD and Altered Images this coming Friday, September the 17th at the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury. Empties. But we're going into the 1980s now, and my special guest coming up after this first track of several by OMD is Andy McCluskey. Good afternoon. This is our special on Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, pioneers of electronic music in the UK, combining an experimental and minimalist ethos with memorable melodies. OMD became central figures in the emergence of synth pop in the late 70s and early 80s. They sold over 40 million records worldwide, released 13 studio albums, and had 17 top 40 hits in the UK. Founders Andy McCluskey and Paul Humphreys met at primary school in the northwest on the Wirral and shared a distaste for guitar-driven rock with its macho attitude. They wanted to do something that was different and chose their name so they wouldn't be mistaken for a punk band. As youngsters, they had a limited budget, so they used second-hand junk shop instruments, such as a left-hand bass guitar that Andy played upside down. And Paul bought a synthesizer from his mother's mail-order catalogue for £7.76. And you can see OMD this Friday in Aylesbury. We say hi to Andy McCluskey. How are you? Hi, Mike. I'm great. How are you? All right, thank you. And looking forward to this gig. What was it like returning to live performance after such a long period of inactivity? because I know you've done some festival gigs. It's just been amazing, to be honest. We, we had a little taster back in June when we did the thrice-delayed charity concert for our crew because, of course, crew members didn't get any furlough money. They kind of fell through all of the schemes. So we finally got to earn some money for them, but that was primarily people paying to watch it you know, online. So it's been great to do the festival, so have real people in front of you. It's just been so wonderful. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. And it's now back again. We are excited to be playing again live but it's you can see the excitement on people's faces that they're out again doing what they want to do so we've been going down really really well did you have to rehearse pretty hard to get back in trim or is omd a thoroughly well-oiled machine after all these years but you know what was quite funny we were concerned because i think it's the longest we've gone recently without playing so we set aside two weeks to do rehearsals and on the second day we were like oh we're bored we know all this it's still in there it's muscle memory <laughs> we don't need two weeks rehearsal <laughs> and what sort of a set then will you be playing at the uh, Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury on Friday the 17th? We basically just decided to do uh, greatest hits, really. It, it's a simple thing. I mean, this concert is separate from our big tour we're doing in November. You know, it's like buses now. They've all been delayed, and now they all come together, so everything's out of sequence. Yeah. I mean, I'm just really looking forward to just getting out there and having a party. And so I think we're going to primarily play most of the hits mm. and just have fun, because we haven't played that for so long. And do you perform the songs pretty much as they were recorded in the studio, or do you change change them around and rearrange them for a live gig. No, we very much stay to the original version. I think it's respectful. I think the song has been good to you. People know it a certain way. So respect it and respect people's memories and play it the way they want to hear it, you know. And do people shout out requests and hold up bits of paper with song titles written on like at a Bruce Springsteen concert? We did a few years ago actually have a little thing where I think we gave the audience four options and, and there would be a fan vote and we would play one but no because we've got everything programmed into keyboards and things and computers it's almost impossible it's like 
is that one in the computer, Paul? Is that pre-programmed? Can we do that one? Because <laughs> he's got to find all the sounds, so it can be a bit tricky. And is it easier playing on stage than it was back in the day because of the changing technology? You can get more out of your computers, more out of your synthesizers and so on. You know it. You know it. Absolutely true. Yeah, the old analogue synthesizers, not only did they weigh a ton, but they tended to drift in tuning and they broke down a lot. So, yeah, the new digital technology, the instruments and the mixing desks and everything, it, it's so much better, so much better. Messages by Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. And the co-founder of OMD is my special guest, ahead of their live gig this coming Friday at the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury, organised by the Friars Music Club, which, as you know, Andy, has a long, long history. It's been at several different venues, but David Stops is still running the club. No doubt he'll introduce you on Friday. And I think you played at the Friars Club back in the day, didn't you? Yeah, we did. I think the last time we played there was in 1980. It was probably our second album tour when Enola Gay had just been a hit so we're looking at almost 41 years since we played at the Friars obviously it's been open and closed a few times in between yeah and the redoubtable Mr Stops has been bugging me for years to come and play Friars <laughs> every time I talk to him like, when are you going to play Friars like, yes okay we're coming to play Friars for old times sake and we're looking forward to it and your support will be Altered Images yeah have you played with them before and Claire Gregan do you know what again I've been trying to rack my brain I don't think I've ever met Claire or we played with them before so again this is going to be fun for us it's just going to add to the party atmosphere i think it's going to be great so you talk about creating this party atmosphere, Andy. I suppose back in the day, electronic performers were seen as being static on stage and a bit aloof from the audience. That was the German influence of Kraftwerk. But that's no longer the case. You're much more at ease as performers, aren't you? And getting back feedback from the audience. Well, I have been renowned for over 40 years now for my idiosyncratic dancing style, shall we say. <laughs> Trainee teacher dancing, it was called, wasn't it? <laughs> that's one of the more kind comparisons. <laughs> Um, as Paul Humphreys says, I've spent over 40 years overcompensating for him standing still playing keyboards. <laughs> but you know what? I can't stand still. I love running around. And although it is a bit weird, my, I think my feeling is, one, I go into a shamanistic trance. That's my excuse. Two, if I dance weirdly, it gives everybody in the audience carte blanche to do whatever they want. Our audiences almost invariably tend to stand up, at least down in the, in the stalls. I, I'm not going to badger people in the balconies to get up because they may want to sit. Now, listen, I'm 62 now. I mean, do I want to stand up for several hours? You know, I, I might stand up during the gig, but then I might want to sit down again before or after. So it's up to what people want to do. But generally, the downstairs stalls, as soon as we come on, they stand up. This is BBC Three Counties Radio, and my special guest is Andy McCluskey from OMD, one of the guiding lights of British synth pop in the 1980s. You met Paul Humphreys at primary school on the Wirral in the early 1960s, and as teenagers in the 70s, you played in a lot of different local bands. Is it true that right from the start, you didn't like guitar driven rock? Yeah, basically, Paul and I were looking to do something different. I wanted to do something that was more experimental, more interesting. I mean, we started out quite experimental, actually. I mean, largely because all we had was my upside-down left-handed bass guitar, and Paul didn't own anything, so he, he cannibalised his aunt's radios and built circuits that made weird noises. So, so to begin with, we were quite abstract and experimental, but, yeah, it was just our hobby, really, just something we did in the back room at his house when his mum was at work on a Saturday. Today. You formed Equinox in 1975, then joined Pegasus, later Hitler's Underpants, and then a band called ID, and then VCL 11, which was uh, named after a diagram on the cover of a Kraftwerk album. Very briefly, for a matter of weeks, The Dalek I Love You, and then you, in 1978, went back to, with Paul to VCL 11, which was renamed OMD, and chosen because you wouldn't be mistaken for a punk band, right? Yeah, I mean, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark is an entirely preposterous name. But the reason was, that, yeah, we wanted people to know that this was going to be different. I mean, basically, before the internet, you didn't know what was going on in places. And if it wasn't in a music paper, you didn't hear about it. So we started to finally, in the summer of 78, hear other bits of electronic music going on in the UK. So 
we went and knocked on the door at Eric's Club in Liverpool where we had played in a sort of prog rock band and we just said, could we come on your Thursday night sort of open night and, and, and play just the two of us doing our kind of electronic stuff? And they went, yeah, what you called? And we went, oh, we haven't got a name because we thought you'd tell us to bugger off. Uh, so, <laughs> so we hurriedly went home and I used to write things on my bedroom wall and on the bedroom wall was, a, was an idea for a song called Orchestral Maneuvers and we thought, that will make people know we're not a punk band. <laughs> of course, in Liverpool, everybody had preposterous names. You know, the Teardrop Explodes, Echo and the Bunnymen, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. <laughs> We talk about influences. You were listening to, what, glam rock, I think, of obviously Roxy Music, and Brian Eno was in that band, and very experimental, David Bowie. And Kraftwerk hit the UK in 75. Other than that, there wasn't a lot to listen to and, and be influenced by, was there? My particular likes were definitely kind of, I could count them on one hand, and you pretty much named most of the fingers already. I just wanted something different, so Paul and I were just having fun, really. And we dared to do this one gig back in, yeah, October 78. <laughs> Literally, it was one gig. It was just to say, we'd done it. And then we got offered another gig and another gig and another gig. And it was just incredible. I mean, basically, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark is a 43-year fabulous accident, a <laughs> hobby that got out of hand, you know. But I'm not complaining. Well, tell me more about that accident, because you released your debut single, Electricity, on Tony Wilson's label, Factory Records. We met Tony Wilson, who was on the telly on Granada Reports, local news. We knew he had bands on. So when we met him, we thought, I tell you, we'll give him a cassette and see if we can blag our way onto the telly. We didn't know he was starting a record company. His wife, and we thought this was apocryphal, his wife got in the car one day and said, what's with the bag of cassettes in the footwell? And he said, I'm taking it to the tip. It's all the rejects, things that, you know, they want to get on the telly or the new label. And she reached into the reject bag, pulled out a cassette and went, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. That's a weird name. He said, oh, they played the club the other day. Rubbish, didn't like it at all. <laughs> Two rural guys whinging on about electric something or other. She put the cassette on in the car. It was our song, Electricity. And she went, that's a hit, love. You need to sign it. And so apparently he patted her patronising on the leg and went, all right, darling, I'll sign them just for you. <laughs> that is how you get a record contract. The wife fishes the cassette out of the reject bag before it gets to the tip. <laughs> Electricity. Paul and I wrote that song when we were 16 years old. And it was incredible a few years later to actually hold in our hands the vinyl single, the seven inch single made by Factory Records, to think that, oh my gosh, we've made this. We wrote this in your mum's house, you know, three years ago. And now look, we've got a record here. I'm incredible. So electricity always will forever have a soft spot for me. And amazingly, that single led to a seven album record deal with Din Discs, which was worth over a quarter of a million pounds. Hey, listen, it sounds a lot of money. They basically just gave you the money to go and spend it in the studio. We didn't put it in our bank. No, you built the home <laughs> studio because I think you thought maybe this project might not last or be successful, right? That's absolutely correct. We were budgeting for failure. <laughs> <laughs> Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark in a song called La Femme Accident and taken from their 1985 album Crush. So we're playing some of their greatest hits and also a couple of songs that you may not know so that you can hear the wide diversity and variety of sounds and arrangements that they've made. They really do make orchestral, mu uh, orchestral music. They really do, don't they? And uh, Sue Bennett is emailed to say, oh, I love OMD. They never made a bad song. My favourite Talking Loud and Clear, followed by Made of New Orleans. Made of Orleans. You put New Orleans in there. Sue, so that's coming up very, very soon. And I got a lovely text in from Lisa. I hope you're still with us, Lisa, in St Albans. She says, I saw OMD last month at Let's Rock in Southampton. They were outstanding. The energy of their headlining set was superb. Not seen them? Honestly, go. You will not be disappointed. And you can see them next Friday at the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury. To book tickets, go to this website, atgtickets.com forward slash venues forward slash Aylesbury. More from Andy McCluskey in a moment. Radio. Must say hello to Christine, who called in from MK. Christine wanted to say thank you for such a lovely show. It really cheers her up. And so, Christine, I'm going to dedicate this next Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark track to you. History of Modern Brackets, Part 1. And thank you for being there, Christine. It's Mike Naylor's Music Mix here on BBC Three Counties Radio with my special guest, Andy McCluskey, co-founder of OMD. 
you supported Joy Division and Gary Newman. And do you owe a big debt of gratitude to Gary Newman for opening up electronic music to the UK because he had those two number ones in 79, mm-hmm. Our Friends Electric and Cars? To be honest, at the time, I had mixed feelings about Gary Newman because, you know, I said everybody was in their bubble. We'd never heard of him. And so we had just got our heads around the fact that there was a band called the Human League who were doing electronic music and Cabaret Voltaire and our friends, Dalek, I Love You. We didn't know there was anybody else doing electronic music. So when Gary came along, we were like, who's he? Where did he come from? So it was a bit frustrating, actually. And then, of course, everybody thought that we were jumping on Gary's bandwagon. So no, 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 we released Electricity first before he had our friends Electric. But the great thing was about Gary was he had bought Electricity, our first single on Factory, and he offered us to support him. It was good for him. He had such a huge stage set. You could only fit a two-man band on stage with a tape recorder, so we were perfect. But you know what? We went out on that big sellout tour with him, and little did we know that we would be headlining the same tour ourselves exactly a year later, having had messages and Enola Gay B hits. So we have a huge debt of gratitude for Gary for introducing us to the big live stages. And of course, there was a whole explosion of electronic music in the early 80s, along with, you mentioned Human League, Gary, Ultravox, Depeche Mode, New Order, Howard Jones, and then Yazoo. Were you in competition with them? Were you looking over your shoulders at what they were doing? Or were you spurring each other on to go and make better records and (laughs) get more success for everybody? Yeah, I would be lying if I said there wasn't some element of competition. Particularly, you know, you you want to be in the charts. It was all about the charts in those days. And so, you know, when we were sitting at number three thinking, oh, isn't this great? And the Human League come in at number two, you're like, damn. (laughs) (laughs) All rivalries have been put aside now. We seem to see all these bands you just mentioned at at festivals these days. But yeah, it was amazing. I mean, you know, what started out for us as a crazy hobby in 1978 Suddenly, by 1980-81, electronic pop music was the new sound. This is BBC Three Counties Radio, and my special guest is Andy McCluskey from OMD. Now, the band's third album, Architecture and Morality, was released 40 years ago, back in 1981, and it was a massive commercial success. It was named after a book that was brought to your attention by Martha Ladley, a member of Martha and the Muffins, who was the girlfriend of Peter Saville, I think, who designed the record sleeve. Yes, it was all very incestuous at Dindis Records. Martha and the Muffins were signed to Dindis. Peter was dating Martha. Martha was the keyboard playing Martha. There were two Marthas. There was singing Martha and keyboard Martha. (laughs) Yeah, Martha Ladley, brilliantly creative lady. Yes, she suggested to me. There was a book called David Watkins that she read called Morality and Architecture. And she said, Architecture and Morality, I think she was the one who said, because what your, your music is, it's a combination of the rigidity of the electronics and the kind of morality and humanity of, of the, the lyrics and the, the emotions. She said, it's a metaphor for your music. I'm like, I'm having that, and I will call it on the architecture of morality. She also gave me the title for Tesla Girls, which was a hit single in 84. How much attention did you pay to reviews? Because um, Architecture and Morality got some mixed ones. Lyndon Barber of Melody Maker wrote, I don't believe the Orcs even care about this record. The style is the same, the content profoundly different, the onslaught of emptiness frivolity disguised by furrowed brows a new brand of meaninglessness yeah the thing was we changed our sound every time we made an album like that was part of the kind of raison d'etre it was to do something different to challenge ourselves and i think people had just got used to accepting our early days kind of garage synth pop then they got their heads around Enola Gay, which, of course, was a massive hit single, but about the plane that dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. So it was exploring the morality of dropping atom bombs. And then we changed direction again, and we started this very kind of swirling, gothic, choral, strange sound on architecture. I mean, basically, I was taking influences from all over us, and I, I loved classical choral music. And I loved the Edinburgh military tattoo with the (laughs) drums. So Made of Orleans is a classic example of that classical choral, religious choral music and military tattoo drums. We had hits by not following any rules, making our own rules, just doing what we wanted. And amazingly, every time we did it, it sold more. So despite what the critics said about architectural morality, it was massive. (laughs) 
and Maid of Orleans is a real example of us doing just what we felt like. It's a waltz time song. It's about Joan of Arc. It's a historical character song. It's not about me singing, ooh, baby, I love you. Lyrical cliches, which I loathed. And also, when we wrote it, it was so short. We tacked on the front this kind of 35 seconds weird, distorted intro to kind of create this strange atmosphere. I remember standing on top of the pops going, this is going to really mess with people's heads. Wait till they hear the intro to this thing. And it still got to number four. The brilliant Maid of Orleans, one of three top five singles from OMD's third album, Architecture and Morality. But the follow-up album, Andy, Dazzle Ships, didn't dazzle. Oh, we, we went a bit weird on that one. Yeah. I admit, yeah. 84, the follow-up, Junk Culture, though. Again, wonderful songs on that. Locomotion in number five, Tesla Girls, 21. Talking Loud and Clear, number 11. I mean, you've had 17 top 40 hits and 13 albums in a 41-year career. It's extraordinary. And the last one, 2017, I think, The Punishment of Luxury, and the one before that, English Electric, still really fresh sound. So you've not dry it up your creative juices are still there andy thank you it's important that if you're going to make a new record that you make it for the right reasons and and when the band reformed it was great fun to be back again with your mates doing the things that you used to love but after a couple of years we were like are we just a tribute band to ourselves now is this all we're all all we're ever going to do is play our hits now we love playing the hits and the audience love the hits but we thought dare we make a new record so we okay but let's not do what many of our contemporaries do which is kind of like a pale pastiche of their former selves. You know, if we're going to do it, we're going to put energy in, we're going to write songs that are interesting, we're going to get the best melodies. We're not going to sound like the 80s, we're going to sound like modern production. And I think that the last few albums have really contemporized us. People are listening to it going, oh my gosh, this is real proper music. This isn't just because they want to tour with a new logo on the T-shirt, you know. And is that reflected in your fan base? You're attracting new fans, not just the those who are in their 50s and 60s mm-hmm. like me. Yeah, no, the, the age demographic at the gigs is definitely expanding. I mean, what also helps is we live in this kind of post-modern era where all popular culture is eating its own history. So a lot of younger people, you know, who when, I wouldn't go and see the bands my parents liked, but a lot of younger people now will listen to anything from any genre, from any era, if they think it's quality. Well, my special guest has been Annie McCluskey from Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. And you can see OMD live this coming Friday, September the 17th, at the Friars Music Club in the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury. And the Architecture and More Tour is in November, celebrating the 40th anniversary of the release of the album, Architecture and Morality. Dates include the Cambridge Corn Exchange on Sunday, November the 7th, the event in Apollo in London on Saturday the 13th, and the new theatre in Oxford on Wednesday the 17th of November. Friars was intended to be a standalone gig and we were just going to, you know, basically come and have a party with altered images and play all the hits, which is largely what we're going to do for the Friars. The tour then in November, which was supposed to be separated by a year from the Friars, is, yeah, it's celebrating architectural morality. But, I mean, we've discussed architectural morality. It had three top five hits on it. And I think it sold. It was almost triple platinum in the UK, so I think it was well over, like, 800,000 just in the UK, the album. Everybody's got it pretty much somewhere in the vinyl collection and so on that tour we're going to play the whole album but in good Morecambe and Wise way we're going to play all the right songs not necessarily in the right order <laughs> <laughs> but then you know once we've done that again we always play our hits you know mm. people do want to hear the hits it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and hearing what you've got to say about the band and it's fantastic that you're still doing it I think I was starting my career in 1980 and loved playing all these records as they came out year by year yeah. And they're still sounding fresh, and we still get good positive reaction when we play Talking Loud and Clear or Forever Loud and Dark. Well, listen, thank you for being on the journey with us, and long may it continue, Mike, and we'll see you down the gig next week. Look forward to seeing you, too. Final track, then, and OMD, of course, have a massive and extensive back catalogue. Earlier, you picked the song Electricity as being one of your favourites. Can you give me one other that means quite a lot to you? I won't cop out by saying it's like asking somebody to pick their favourite child. Obviously, Enola Gay just kick things wide open internationally. I mean, everybody knows that song. I mean, that, everybody knows that song all around the world. It's incredible. You know, it was, it was used in the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics. And it's about a subject that I wanted to sing about. It's, it's about a, what I thought was a really important and relevant subject. And so I thought it really encapsulated what we were trying to do, you know, make great electronic pop music, a little different and an interesting lyric. And do you know what? 
when I walk up to the mic and I'm waiting for the drum machine to start on Enola Gay, that do, 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 that everybody knows. And I sound big headed now because everybody does know, but it, it, it's a great thing because it is like being in a game of poker, knowing you're about to drop three aces and two kings. It's a winning <laughs> hand. The crowd are going to go mental and everybody's going to be happy. You know? <laughs> Well, my grateful thanks to Andy McCluskey for taking time out to talk to us here on BBC Three Counties Radio. Ah, oh, the music of our youth from the 1980s, eh? What a terrific guy. And uh, a 43-year accident and a hobby that got out of hand. Great quote. But as he then said just towards the end, we're not a tribute band to ourselves. You can see OMD supported by Altered Images this coming Friday, the 17th of September. That's at the Aylesbury Waterside Theatre. OK, I'm going to book my tickets later on this afternoon i really want to see them I, I'm, I'm still a big fan and i hope that we played you some great tracks that you can see how varied and original they were and still are really really good omd thanks andy